Multiple explosions rocked Beijing overnight. A hundred fire trucks showed up with helicopters hovering nearby. The timing is sensitive. A Chinese province with a population of 46 million is entering wartime status due to the CCP virus epidemic, while authorities only reported a dozen cases. Heavy rain and mudslides hit South China. Worries about food shortages are on the rise. In China, many company general managers have a second job, managing a local prison, a look into China's prison companies. And the U.S. is preparing to work with Taiwan to move supply chains out of China. The FBI liaison to Taiwan appeared for the first time at the Taiwan Bureau of Investigation's press conference. And Taiwan's representative to the U.S. updated her Twitter bio to say Taiwan ambassador to the U.S. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now to China Southwest. Authorities in Yunnan province on Saturday announced wartime status for the area. The declaration means that the entire province is required to fully enter wartime status and strengthen its border control. The announcement didn't detail what specific measures would be taken. But based on wartime status action in other regions, including Beijing, main tactics will likely include neighborhood lockdowns, the suspension of public transportation, highways and air travel, and the closing of shops. Last week, Yunnan's Reili city was put under lockdown after two cases of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, virus were reportedly discovered there. As a result, over 200,000 Rayleigh citizens were made to take virus tests. A makeshift hospital was built with enough room to house nearly 1,000 patients, and at least 200 medical staff were sent there from a neighboring city. The harsh measures prompted questions about why officials pushed for such an extreme response if there were really only two confirmed cases in the area. When wartime status was announced for Yunnan province over the weekend, the situation there didn't appear serious either, at least according to official figures. The Yunnan Provincial Health Commission said that as of September 18th, there were only nine symptomatic cases and five asymptomatic cases in the entire province. Yunnan province has a population of 46 million people. That's even more than California, the most populated state in the U.S. Zhang Wenhong, a virus expert from Shanghai, said over the weekend that a second pandemic wave in China this winter is inevitable. He added that 80 percent of patients will show no symptoms. According to Chinese locals we've spoken to, the pandemic has continued to spread across the country following its peak months ago. That's despite state-run media reports and official numbers, which claim the country has seen few to no cases in recent months. Now we take a look at the flooding in China. The situation is getting much better than months ago. But in some areas, it is still serious due to heavy rain not seen in decades. In the southwestern province of Guizhou, many areas suffered from heavy rain and mudslides in recent days. A parking lot collapsed. Three cars had already washed away, and three cars were still standing there, stuck on the crumbling earth beneath them. Houses submerged in water, roads turning into rivers. A car is seen drifting on the surface of the river. The man who shot the clip said he hasn't seen flooding like this in decades. In a village, over 80 houses were submerged in water. Only six houses were spared. This house has three floors. Now only half of the third floor can still be seen. Many houses are completely underwater. Elderly locals said they have never seen flood water reach this level in their whole lives. Rice fields are soaked in water. The person shooting the video said it seems the key words for next year will be food shortage. Now we take a look at Huashan village in this province, where according to locals, a nearby dam collapsed. Some houses were damaged and water came into people's homes. This video shows the scene after a mudslide. From September 13th to the 17th, heavy rain and landslides hit Mi'i County in southwestern province of Sichuan. Two days later, and the impact can be seen. 
A vast amount of stones and debris brought down from the mountainsides have washed over the village. Cars are buried, streets are covered, even the schoolyard is under a thick layer of mud and stones. The villagers don't know where to begin in trying to clear it out. Now we turn to southern China. On Friday, heavy rainfall accompanied by lightning hit the coastal city Shantou. Heavy rain is usually not the only reason for the water log in Chinese cities. The low-quality flood drainage system is playing a big role too. Now to Beijing, where multiple explosions rocked two of the city's districts in the middle of the night. The blast struck just before midnight on Friday at the junction of the Sunyi and Tongzhou districts. Locals reported being woken up by the explosions, saying more than 100 fire trucks showed up soon after on the scene. Some wrote they also spotted helicopters hovering nearby. But later on, almost all related posts on Chinese social media were deleted by authorities. The next day, 12 hours after the blasts, local authorities claimed the accident was caused by gas tanks stored in the warehouse. They also emphasized that there were no casualties. But the sensitive timing of the incident triggered speculation online. October 1st is National Day in China. It marks the anniversary of when the Chinese Communist Party built up its regime 71 years ago. Now we take a look at China's financial sector. In China, officials refer to anything that could reflect poorly on the regime's reputation as having negative energy. As such, it's rare for authorities to allow local media reports about negative incidents, including bank runs. But on Friday, the answer to one journalist's question indirectly confirmed that bank runs did happen. Addressing the Consumer Protection Bureau of China Banking and the Insurance Regulatory Commission, a journalist mentioned rumors that bank runs had been happening in some areas since last year. The reporter asked the agencies to comment on the issue. In their answer, officials blamed the problems on bank customers' lack of financial knowledge and accused them of blindly following rumors. They even went as far to attribute it to the customers' advanced ages, implying that they are too old to act rationally. Officials called the bank runs unnecessary. Due to the Chinese regime's lack of transparency, we could only obtain information about five bank runs so far this year. Contrary to authorities' claims, there appear to be other reasons behind the bank runs. One bank stock price recently plummeted. Another bank was reported to have broken the capital chain, and the bank's president went missing. The third bank's non-performing loan rate was reportedly on the rise. The fourth bank was listed as a dishonest institution by a court ruling. Lastly, the president of the fifth bank was put under investigation. The bank's revenue plummeted, and its major shareholders were also officially listed as dishonest persons. After each bank run, some customers were arrested and accused of spreading what authorities called rumors. In China, general managers of some companies have another job running the local prison. Their employees are no ordinary people either. They are inmates working inside their cells, including prisoners of conscience. NTD's Juliet Song reports. It's been four years since Liu Jing came to the U.S., but memories of working as a forced laborer in Chinese prisons still flash back from time to time. At the maximum, each person had to wrap 10,000 chopsticks in one day. Those chopsticks would fill up a huge bag. And it's not just chopsticks. She also knitted sweaters and scarves. 50 to 60 hours a week, for seven years, up until 2009. And Liu said prisoners have to meet their assigned quotas. Some people were very slow when knitting sweaters, and they had to stay up all night finishing up the work. They couldn't go to sleep. For all the work Liu did, she was paid less than a dollar per month. She knew the products she made were for export, but it was unclear which country they were for as the prison was very secretive about it. 
The prison is very closed. Many things in there were kept secret, and you're not allowed to talk about it. Even eye contact wasn't allowed there, not to mention conversation. Unlike other prisoners, Liu was sentenced for her spiritual belief. She practices Falun Gong, a spiritual meditation practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. The practice was immensely popular in China in the 90s. But in 1999, the regime imposed a strict crackdown and began to brutally persecute it. It's continued for over two decades. Inside the prison, even on days when Liu felt very weak, she was still forced to work. For me, it was very hard. I was exhausted. Liu was an element in China's vast prison system. In it, prisoners are used as forced labor to generate profit for the state. That includes prisoners of conscience, like members of the Uyghur ethnic group, and Falun Gong practitioners. In China, some company has hold another job, management positions in a local prison. That's because many Chinese prisons have their own companies, and many of them are state-owned. For example, in China's southwest Sichuan, the vice chief of the bureau that oversees Sichuan's prisons is also the general manager of the prison's company. The company, called Sichuan Hexiang, has a range of services, from manufacturing clothing to dealing with real estate. The company has 43 subsidiaries, each belonging to a different prison in Sichuan, but it's not the only province where they're found. A 2019 Human Rights Report found that the legal representatives of over two thirds of China's prison companies are also the heads of their local prisons or prison bureaus. Under U.S. law, imports made by forced labor are illegal, but it's hard for foreign companies to do their due diligence when there's a lack of transparency. Prison labor is also common in China's supply chain. That's because the law demands that prisoners must work. Adult prisoners are forced to work eight hours a day. Juliet Song, NTD News. The relatives of 12 Hong Kongers detained in China are demanding information from Chinese authorities. They say they do not know the condition of their family member, nor are they allowed to meet with their lawyer. The families of 12 Hong Kongers detained last month by Chinese authorities are calling for their right to use their own selected lawyers. The 12 were arrested on August 23rd for illegal entry into mainland Chinese waters. They were setting off from Hong Kong in a boat bound for self-ruled Taiwan. All were suspected of being involved in anti-government protests that erupted last year. Ten of the 12 had been charged and were released on bail and not allowed to leave the former British colony. Relatives of some of the detainees held a news conference outside the Hong Kong police headquarters to express their frustration with local authorities. We have a lot of questions at the moment, so we urge Hong Kong police to do a thorough investigation of this case. The relatives asked police to release details of the arrest and whether there were any injuries or casualties. However, up to now, the lawyers appointed by the families have been refused to meet with the detainees. In the other words, the conditions of the so-called arrested person are still known only to the Chinese authority. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam said the 12 were running away from the law and would have to be dealt with by mainland authorities, but she would provide feasible assistance. Also in Hong Kong, professionals in Hong Kong appear to be losing faith in the city's legal system. A foreign judge serving on Hong Kong's highest court has just resigned. His decision was reportedly due to concerns over the new national security law in Hong Kong, recently imposed by Beijing. Veteran Australian judge James Spiegelman is one of the 14 foreign judges on Hong Kong's highest court. Spiegelman told Australia's national broadcaster that he had resigned for reasons related to the content of the national security legislation. He did not elaborate further. Both local and international legal circles have expressed alarm over Beijing's imposition of the security law, many fearing it will erode the former British colony's democratic freedoms. Amid Beijing's efforts to regain control of the region, Western countries have begun to express more and more support for democratic Hong Kong. Recently, the U.S. and U.K. have both taken new actions, clearly expressing their distrust of the Chinese regime.
The U.S. government last week urged citizens to reconsider travel to China, including to Hong Kong. The notice cited both the CCP virus concerns and what was referred to as arbitrary enforcement of local laws. The notice also added that Beijing unilaterally and arbitrarily exercises police and security power in Hong Kong. Likewise, the UK also issued a travel advisory for China last week, warning that Britons who travel there may be at risk of arbitrary detention. So far, Chinese authorities have detained several foreigners for what Beijing calls endangering national security. A Taiwanese official said the U.S. and Taiwan will soon hold economic dialogues at a senior level. That's after a senior U.S. State Department official met local business leaders on the island last week. An expert says the U.S. is preparing to work with Taiwan to move supply chains out of China. The U.S. and Taiwan will soon begin formal talks about their business ties. That's according to Taiwan's Minister of Economic Affairs. She announced the plan following U.S. Under Secretary of State Keith Crouch's visit to the island last week. Crouch is the second high-profile U.S. official to visit Taiwan within two months. Our communication with the U.S. State Department is a very important step. And step by step, we can deepen the cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan on different issues. The official said that in a closed-door meeting, the two sides discussed issues including 5G, the reconstruction of supply chains, Indo-Pacific strategy, and more. The U.S. official met with Taiwan's president as well as local business leaders, like the founder of Taiwan's Semiconductor Manufacturing Corp., or TSMC, Morris Chang. TSMC is a major chip supplier for Apple, and before the U.S. imposed sanctions, Huawei. Earlier this year, it announced a $12 billion investment to build a U.S. manufacturing plant in Arizona. The factory would bring in over 1,600 jobs. The Taiwanese chief producer also has factories in mainland China. During his visit, Kroc may persuade Taiwan to move the semiconductor industry clusters to the U.S., that is, the upstream and downstream industries of TSMC, the entire industry cluster instead of just one factory. Taiwanese economist Wu Chialong said the U.S. sees it as a bigger effort to work with Taiwan to move important supply chains out of China. The restructuring of supply chains is the main issue he is here to discuss. It would be best if these manufacturing supply chains can move out of mainland China to the U.S. Otherwise, they should at least move out of China. He said other than the semiconductor industry, the U.S. may push toward moving its medical supply chain out of China and into Taiwan and encourage Taiwan's petrochemical industry to invest in the U.S. We know that in mainland China, about 80 percent of their top 10, top 20 export companies are actually owned by Taiwanese businesses. They use mainland China as a base for product processing and then export the products. If they want to move the supply chain out of mainland China, the main player here are these Taiwanese businesses. Taiwanese media reported that the U.S. official invited about 30 Taiwanese business leaders to meetings. Two of them rejected the invitation. Because they have a lot of business in China, the majority of their businesses are in China, they are scared of the Chinese Communist Party and so didn't dare to attend the meeting. So this proves to Keith Kroc that the pro-Beijing business groups in Taiwan still haven't been dealt with. Beijing has been accused of infiltrating Taiwan through buying up Taiwanese media companies for positive coverage and using Taiwanese business groups to lobby for pro-Beijing policies. The Taiwanese government passed an anti-infiltration law earlier this year to counter Beijing's influence. The authorities have also been providing subsidies to encourage Taiwanese businesses to move their factories from mainland China back to Taiwan. Penny Zhou, NTD News. In a significant move, the FBI liaison to Taiwan, Nicholas Garcia, thanked Taiwan for helping in the crackdown against a global hacking campaign by Chinese hackers. Garcia also appeared for the first time at the Taiwan Bureau of Investigation's press conference last Friday, signaling further cooperation between the two countries. This after the U.S. Justice Department announced charges against five members of a Chinese hacking group. They're alleged to be behind cyber attacks on 100 companies and government institutions globally. The group is known as APT-41 or Barium Winti Wicked Panda or Wicked Spider.
The five hackers were indicted in separate grand juries in August last year and this year. They remain at large. The Taiwan Bureau Director General said at a press conference his bureau discovered the hackers' ties to the group after getting reports in May that three Taiwan-based firms were under cyber attack. After detailed investigation, the bureau found the hackers used a relay station in the U.S. They passed the information on to the FBI, which led to the recent crackdown and indictments. The hacking group is suspected of having close ties to the Chinese regime, particularly to public security officials. The U.S. Department of Justice Deputy Attorney General last week called out the Chinese regime for not working with U.S. prosecutors in tracking down the hackers. The U.S. has upped its pressure recently against threats from abroad, including charges against other Chinese hackers in July, targeting virus vaccine research firms. And Taiwan's representative to the U.S., Xiao Meiqing, caused a media uproar over the weekend after she updated her Twitter bio to say Taiwan ambassador to the U.S. The U.S. currently does not have formal ties with the Democratic Island after severing them in 1979 in order to recognize the Chinese regime. An ambassador rank would signal formal ties between the U.S. and Taiwan, which would trigger already tense relations between Washington and Beijing. Xiao clarified in a post, saying, Sorry to disappoint so many supporters, but Taiwan ambassador is what many call me and also my job description. My title remains Representative Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office when engaging with the U.S. government. She added the work she does is no different from other embassies. Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen told reporters on Sunday that no matter what Xiao's title was, she would continue to work hard for the island. President Trump says his administration won't approve the sale of TikTok to Oracle and Walmart if China's bite dance maintains any control. On Saturday, he said the proposed deal severed ties to China and he gave it his blessing. Over the weekend, President Trump said he approved a partnership deal in principle that would allow TikTok to operate in the United States. Under the agreement, TikTok's Beijing-based parent company, ByteDance, will create a new company headquartered in the United States, which promises to bring 25,000 jobs. Trump's August 14th executive order gave ByteDance 90 days to sell TikTok. But Saturday's deal is structured as a partnership, not a divestment. Oracle would hold a 12.5 percent stake and Walmart would hold a 7.5 percent stake in the company. Four out of five board members would be American. ByteDance would still reportedly hold an 80 percent ownership of the company. But given that American investors own about 40 percent of ByteDance, an unnamed source told Reuters it could be described as majority American owned. The Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States is to review any deal before it can go through. Last week, the Commerce Department banned U.S. app stores from carrying TikTok starting Sunday. But because the president initially approved the deal, they postponed the start date until this coming Sunday. A judge in San Francisco is blocking President Trump's ban on WeChat downloads for now. On Sunday, the federal judge temporarily blocked Trump's executive order to shut down the app. The Commerce Department had issued restrictions against both TikTok and WeChat, citing national security concerns. The Justice Department argued that WeChat users could switch to other apps or platforms. But the judge said the ban represents a violation of free speech. And the Trump administration didn't provide enough evidence to address national security concerns. The judge said there are other ways to complete such a ban, like barring WeChat from government devices. The Chinese Communist Party has launched a system to sanction foreign companies deemed harmful to Chinese interests. China's Commerce Ministry says it will target foreign firms that endanger China's sovereignty and security. NTD's Patrick Hayden spoke with a Chinese finance expert to see what's behind the move. The Chinese regime has issued rules in its proposed unreliable entities list, which enables it to sanction foreign companies. Chinese finance specialist Frank Tian says the Chinese Communist Party is trying to show that they're still in control. But if you look at the Chinese uh, list, you know, it's kind of uh, ironic. It's, uh, it's just uh, insane because they really want to do business with America. They want those American companies to either uh, sell their uh, technology to, to China 
or have the production or have the products sold in China. The move comes one day after the U.S. announced it would ban TikTok and WeChat. He thinks that we shouldn't underestimate the scale of what's going on as tensions rise. The Chinese economy is really in, uh, in, in trouble, deep trouble, deep water right now. So they need everything. They, uh, they need the American market and they need American technology and they need foreign capital. He says China is also reacting to improving relationships between the U.S. and Taiwan. They notice that the U.S.-Taiwan relationship is, uh, is, on the, is uh, really rising fast, you know, escalating fast. He said internally in China there is a lot of pressure between two main factions within the CCP to demonstrate that China is not America's puppy dog. So the move is partly to demonstrate some strength internally in the government and also to the Chinese people. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.